Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to talk about taking notes. Now taking notes is incredibly important as a software developer or for any career for that matter. Our brains just aren't designed for remembering lots of information. So it's important to write it down and especially in a way that you can find it later on. In this video, I'm going to be covering how I take notes as well as the software I use to make sure I can find them when I need them. I've tried many times to go fully digital with my notes. I've got an iPad, so I've used things like Notability to try and keep notes in a digital format. But I find every time that I always end up just taking less notes as a result. There's just something about having a notebook and a pen that just reduces that friction and allows you to take notes a lot more easily. So I always have a couple of notebooks lying around on my desk, so I always have somewhere to take my notes when I need them. I generally like to use squared notebook paper because it just makes it easier for doing things like diagrams and flowcharts in. I also use my notebooks to keep a running to-do list for all of the items that I've got to complete that day. And whenever someone comes up to my desks and asks me for something, I'll add it to the bottom of my to-do list and my notebook. And then once that item's done, I can just tick it off and know that I've done it. I particularly like the soft lever effect cover notebooks. So I tend to lean towards Moleskin or Lechterm 1917 as my go-to choice. For pens, I like to have a range of colours to hand so I can highlight things in my notes. But generally, I just go with whatever I have on my desk, which is usually something like a BIC. If I'm taking a course or I've written a note that I want to retain later, then these I'll generally type up into my note-taking application. Now, there's two note-taking applications that I like to use, and their use is mostly divided into business and personal. So the first one is Notion. So for anything that's related to content creation, such as producing YouTube videos or writing blog posts, these I always keep track in Notion. Notion is great for things like project tracking because it has different views that you can set up. So I have a Kanban view, so I know what I'm currently working on and what I've got coming next. I have a calendar view, so I know when my blog posts are going out or when my videos are due to go out. I also use it for my personal coding projects, such as doing any work on my website. Because Notion has a really good mobile app, it's great for adding things like blog post ideas or YouTube video ideas. I can add them quite quickly to my backlog so I don't forget them. Part of the reason that I do all this in Notion is because it's easily shareable. If I ever expand my team and I hire some help to help me produce my YouTube videos, for example, then I can give them access to my Notion board and all the resources that I have in there. When I think about it, most of what I keep in Notion is really transactional in nature. So for example, I keep track of my blog posts and when they go out, but I don't really look at them or any of those notes after they've been published. Now, part of the reason that I do this is because Notion is a proprietary platform. Notion basically own my data. And sure, I can export it, but it's not particularly easy to export and get it into the formats that you need for other applications. If Notion was to suddenly disappear or have a massive server error, then I'd lose everything. Now, obviously, if I was to lose it all, I'd be quite upset because I'd have to do all of my planning again, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. I haven't lost lots of knowledge because I'm not storing it in Notion. Now, for all my personal notes and anything that I want to keep long term, I'll put this all into Obsidian. Now, Obsidian is a free application. It works on all platforms, but it's not as polished as Notion is. You can do most things that you can do in Notion in Obsidian, but generally you need to use plugins and it does take a bit of tinkering to get it to work. So the key thing with Obsidian is you own your data. Everything's just stored as markdown files in folders. So if Obsidian was to go away, you'd still have all your notes in a very readable format. With that freedom obviously comes with the responsibility that you need to be able to back up your own data. So Obsidian does offer a cloud sync option for a monthly fee, but generally I just use iCloud to back up my notes and then I do a further backup to GitHub as well. So for any of my handwritten notes that I end up writing that I wanna keep, these I then type out manually into Obsidian. When you first get started with taking notes, it can all be a bit disorganized to begin with. But over time, you do come up with different ways to organize your notes. I went through quite a few iterations on how I organize my notes until my friend bought me this book, Building a Second Brain by Diego Forte. And in it, he goes through the four main areas that you should store your notes in. So he has the acronym PARA to describe this, which is Projects, Areas, Resources and Archive. And in the book, he covers how to take notes as well as which folder you should put your notes in depending on what you're working on. If you're interested, there's a link to the book in the description and there's also a link to a complete summary of the book on my website. The way I organize my notes is loosely based on this book, but I've also incorporated some other concepts from how to take smart notes, which is based on the Zettelkasten method. Now, generally my notes are broken down into seven different folders. The first is the inbox. This is where all my notes first arrive. I have a few automations set up from other applications that I'll cover in a bit. Generally, everything in here needs to be sorted or broken down into individual notes. These are sometimes called fleeting notes in the Zettelkasten method. My second folder is projects. 
I generally create a separate folder for each project I'm working on, whether that be a redesign on my website or notes on a course I'm taking. This is similar to how Diego does it in his book. The third folder is the knowledge folder. This stores all my permanent notes. It's what they call a digital garden of knowledge with links to other bits of information. This folder doesn't contain any subfolders, which is where I differ from the building a second brain book. The idea here is that our brains don't store knowledge in set folders. It's more of an interconnected web of knowledge. What I do have are what we call maps of content. These are notes on high level topics that help link together related notes. The idea of the knowledge folder is that each note should be quite small. It isn't like a blog post containing everything on a subject. It's more like a few paragraphs explaining a concept. The fourth folder is references. When I do write a comprehensive book summary or an article for my blog, then this gets stored in the references folder. Also, when I'm taking notes on a course, I might have these all in one big master note, but later break it down into key areas of knowledge. The fifth folder is the archive. If a note is no longer relevant, I don't delete it. I just move it to the archive. At least that way, it still shows up if I search for it. My sixth folder is what I call extras. Obsidian gives you a few ways where you can specify a folder for attachments or for templates. These all go into my extras folder. And the last folder is the later folder. I use automation to take highlights from other applications, but it does mean my inbox gets quite large. If the highlight is useful, but I don't want to turn it into a permanent note, then I just move it to a later folder to get it out of my inbox. If it comes up in my search results, then I might decide then that I want to turn it into a permanent note. As I mentioned earlier, I have automation set up that all feed into Obsidian. All of this goes into my inbox folder for me to then sort out later. Now, the first application I use is called Matter. Matter lets you save articles to it or tweets from Twitter and then make highlights from it. Now, I used to use Instapaper for this, but Matter has a really good feature where if you send it a Twitter thread, it will expand it for you so you can see it all in one place. Matter can also sync with Gmail or you can send emails to the app. And this can be really great to have all of your newsletters in one place. Matter is based around people. So if you have particular writers that you follow, you can see all of their writing in one place, which is really useful. Now, once all my highlights have been made in Matter, I then forward them to Readwise. Now, Readwise syncs all of my highlights from my Kindle books, as well as I can use the app to be able to take highlights from physical books as well. Readwise has a great feature where they send you an email summary of some of your best highlights. So you can go through them and remind yourself about some of the key concepts in the books that you've read. Finally, I have Readwise sync with Obsidian so that I have all of these highlights from both Matter and Readwise sync into my inbox folder. I then further break this down into articles, tweets and books so it's easy for me to find highlights when I need them. That's it for today's video. If you like this video, then you might like this one on the 11 ways to make money as a software developer. Thank you for watching and I'll hopefully see you in the next video.